as an author of many books. This is not just the one and only. Oh, we should have the book here, by the way. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, the the book and and the the life. It's about the life of Richard Saint Baker, the very first conservationist, myth, better globally known as the Man of Trees, and uh, he. Uh, uh, he also happened to be a Baha'i, but that's not why we're talking about him, because we just uh, uh, treasure and appreciate the fact that he was a Baha'i, but he was really a global citizen who believed in, in uh, salvation of trees to such as the Sahara Desert, the Green Project is all launched by him, conceptualized. You don't have to tell the whole story because then I'll have nothing left. So, yeah. so <laughs> that's what am I doing? So Paul has written many books and Paul, one of them is called Eleven, right? And this is the other one right there. Yeah. And <coughs> are those the two or do you have more? I've got six books. Six yeah. books. Yeah. And those six books are all climate, agricultural. They're related to environment and agriculture, all of them. Yeah, and I also have uh, about St. Barbaker, I have a children's book too. Yeah, no, see, it's for a children's book, so this is really a nice. cool thing to, to train the little ones early about preservation, right? Yeah. And so, without further ado, Paul, why don't okay. you just go ahead? Sure, and... thanks, Nadina. It's, it's great to be here, and thanks so much for having me and for coming out, everyone, and into this very unusual and eclectic eclectic space that's uh it's kind of fascinating it's like what you know what is this and so that's exciting and, and thanks for mark and carmen coming and bringing the average age of the group down to about 69. <laughs> it's kind of cool to have you guys here and i can uh, remember that line that was a good line <laughs> you know. yeah so uh yeah, I'm just happy to share the story a bit of the life of Richard St. Bar Baker, who is a very, also a very unusual human being. And uh, we'll just launch into it, but um, I think uh, what we're going to start with is not him, but somebody else, uh, a name, man named Tony Renato. And I just want to share a little bit about his life, and then I'll explain why I'm talking about him at the beginning, uh, rather than Richard St. Baker, And there's just a short clip of him. Hi, sure. my name's Tony Renato, and I've been writing my autobiography, The Forest Underground, Hope for a Planet in Crisis. My family and I lived in Niger Republic, West Africa, for 17 years, helping rural communities. For the first two and a half years, we tried to stop the encroaching deserts <coughs> by planting trees. But I was miserable. The solution was an answer to prayer. And literally at my feet, I discovered the underground forest, a vast network of living tree stumps and seeds in the ground with the ability to re sprout quickly and at low cost. We call this method farmer managed natural regeneration or FMNR. Over the following 20 years, FMNR spread from farmer to farmer across more than 5 million hectares regenerating over 200 million trees and bringing great benefits to the communities. Increased crop yields, more fodder, more fuel wood, and greater resilience in the face of climatic shocks. This site that you see here, four years ago there was only one tree on the whole site. What had been a vicious cycle of land degradation and poverty became a virtuous cycle of restoration and hope. In the book, I go into details on what led me to Niger in the first place and the causes of deforestation. I write about the challenges and the struggles of working with rural communities, helping them to restore their land, and the global spread of FMNR today. Wow. FMNR can be a powerful tool to combat climate change and land degradation and the terrible consequences on people. At its core, this is a story of hope hope against all the odds and as such this is a story for today as we face the seemingly hopeless challenge of climate change replicated at scale fmnr can draw down millions of pounds of carbon dioxide providing a nature-based solution to climate change so i'm asking for your help to get this book published and out into the world any amount that you give will make an invaluable contribution in sharing this story widely and inspiring the next generation 
So thank you for your help. So, um, this fellow, Tony Ronaldo, um, who has now received the Right Livelihood Award, which is kind of like an alternate Nobel Prize, uh, is considered to be the most successful person in the world in desert reclamation. So he's planted something like third. He's worked with people to plant something like 240 million trees and restore a huge area of desert in Niger. And so uh, Tony sent, he, he's now published this book and he sent me a copy of the book and so on. But uh, the reason I brought him up is because his inspiration was Richard St. Barbega. So he was a young uh, teenager in Australia and he and his father went, were far, his family were farmers. They went to a neighboring farm. And in, in the farm he saw in this, just an old shed, he saw a pile of books. And then on the top of the pile of books was a, was a book by Richard St. Barb Baker. And so he picks up the book, kind of interested and it takes it home and it changes his life. It's a book about desert reclamation and fighting the Sahara Desert. So he, he decides to dedicate himself to tree planting in the Sahara and, and fighting the desert and develops the most successful project that's ever been developed in the Sahara for reclamation. So this seems to be one of the, the really interesting parts of St. Barb Baker is even not so much what he did, but what he how he influenced other people. So, uh, Baker was born in, in 1889 and, and died in 1982. Just before he died, he came to Seattle, yeah, I, I three heard. Months. And uh, then he moved on to Saskatoon, which is where we lived, and that's where he passed away. But uh, he has been called by uh, the US Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, called him the world's greatest conservationist. And uh, Udall himself was a great conservationist. So he has uh, actually been honored. Uh, for example, he was the first life member of the World Wildlife Fund in 1969 when it formed. And the reason why he was considered this is because he was such a visionary. He was, uh, you know, many of the things that we think about today, like rainforest conservation, sustainable development, small older farmers, mass migrations of people, grassroots development processes, desert reclamation, biodiversity, indigenous culture and rights, agroforestry, agroecology. These were all things that he was talking about a hundred years ago. So, and, and many, many more different things uh, that are, you know, climate change and this kind of thing, which was really not talked about at the time were the, were the things he was talking about in the 1920s. So we'll just look at a little bit about his background. So um, I think of him as having kind of four spiritual foundations for his work. And the first one was Christian millennialism. So his family were very much engaged in, in uh, millennial Christianity in the early part, the, la the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th. And this was very much an influence on him his expectation of the return of Christ was very uh, strong in his family. And his family, his father was a, a nurseryman, a tree, had a tree nursery. That was what he did for, for a living, but he was also a lay minister and built a chapel in his yard. And people would come from all over England to, to visit this chapel and, and hear the different sermons about the future and the return of Christ and so on. And so this is a picture of little Richard in his kind of sailor suit. And you can kind of get a, a, a sense of who he is from that picture, I think. He's kind of a, a very bold person, the kind of guy who would go up, you know, go meet the king and the president, introduce himself and, and travel the world, meeting all of the leaders and so on. And, and really had this very, very strong sense of confidence and mission in his life. The second spiritual foundation was his relationship to nature. So when he was a little boy, I think he was four years old, and he was look, being looked after by, by the family. He had a nurse uh, who looked after him, and she was a, a woman who was very versed in 
in nature and nature stories and so on, and and kind of uh, interest in how nature was alive and the forest was alive and there were forest creatures and you can tell them all these stories, and they gave them quite a bit of freedom. But she said, "Don't go off into the forest by yourself." But he did as a little boy, and he went into the forest and he basically got lost. But he said he didn't feel like he was lost. He felt like he had come home, had found himself. So he was wandering the forest. He walked into a glade, like very much like in this picture, with a, you know, the filtered light streaming through, and had a mystical experience of union with, with trees and with the forest. And that was this kind of deep spiritual uh, foundation for his thinking about ecology and so on. And then uh, in 1909, so he would have been around 19, 20 years old, he decided to, uh, like a lot of young men, to go, go west, go into Canada and see the world and become a homesteader. So he moved to Beaver Creek, Saskatchewan, which is just outside of Saskatoon. And Saskatoon was a little town. And I think he said during the, the period that he was there, it grew by something like 20,000 people, mm. like from a little town into, into a small city. So it was, a, you know, people were kind of pouring into the prairie region. Well, the first students at the university, wow. He was one of the first students, one of the first hundred students at the university, a, a new university that was formed in Saskatoon. And uh, at Beaver Creek, which is now, he kind of had a bit of a fairy dust or something, because now it's a big conservation center. Uh, the place where he had his homestead. He wasn't a very successful farmer. He didn't like, uh, for him, he said plowing up, breaking the land and plowing it made him feel, feel bad because he, he was sort of turning up all these little trees and bushes and so on. And even then he had this affection for trees. But uh, near the place where he lived used to be the White Cap uh, Dakota First Nation. It was called Moose Woods Reserve at the time. And uh, he started to become friends with those people. And the person at the front of this vehicle, remember the, there was cramped vehicles? Mm -hmm. I don't remember having cramped vehicles, but I know they were there. And that man's name is Charlie Eagle. <coughs> and he became a very close friend of Charlie Eagle's and would visit the reserve. And there he said this became his, his um, his third spiritual foundation was connecting with indigenous worldviews. And he said, really, it was his connection with these people who were, were uh, our Dakota First Nations. And uh, he connected with their ceremonies and so on. For example, this, this ceremony of the, the rain dance or the sun dance, they call it, with this central tree holding up the, holding up the lodge and all the symbolism involved in trees and their kind of advanced um, ecological worldview was a big influence on him. And then during the summers, he became a lumberjack, would go up to northern Saskatchewan. And at the time, it, Big River was the <coughs> largest sawmill in the British Empire, so north of Saskatoon. Which, Saskatoon is in Saskatchewan, which is basically north of Montana, North Dakota. And so he experienced this forestry firsthand and found that the, uh, the, the wasteful forestry practices really alarmed him. And so he decided to leave Saskatchewan and go back to England and study forestry. But in the meantime, uh, the First World War intervened. He became a, a soldier uh, and he was a decorated soldier, wounded and wounded twice. One time he was, at, one of the interesting things about him is he had four or no, five near-death experiences where he really? actually died and was revived. But in one of them he was, in the war he was, uh, there was just a, a lot of soldiers were killed and they were all kind of piled up uh, to be removed for burial. And when they came to him, they pulled off his dog tags and he started to bleed. Yeah. And so they knew he was actually alive. And so at that time he was saved and, and uh, <clears throat> twice during the war he was injured and invalided out. 
But anyways, he survived, went on to Cambridge Forestry School. This is him, uh, second from the left on the bottom, studying <coughs> forestry. <coughs> a creative person, uh, he didn't have a lot of money, he never did during his life, but uh, after the war, he basically invented the first caravan, so a recreational trailer. Uh, oh. And uh, he never patented it, the concept. So it's based on a traditional gypsy wagon, like the one on the right. And so he developed this trailer, and his idea was, you know, people could pull it behind their cars. And he made it out of air, airplane parts left over from the war. And, uh, and that's how he financed his, his university training. So, and he is actually credit, I, is this for real? But the, uh, the Travelers Association, or whatever they're called in Britain, they credit him with inventing the, inventing the trailer. Really? So in, by 1920, he had finished his uh, forestry degree, and he joined the colonial service, the British colonial service, and went to Kenya first. So he spent the 20s in Africa, in Kenya, and Nigeria as a conservator of forests. Uh, and he witnessed there the early desertification that was happening in the Sahel region, the southern part of the, below the Sahara Desert. And so uh, he witnessed, started to witness the first big waves of environmental refugees. So people were kind of moving out of the Sahel, out of the, the Sahara because of the expanding desert. And so a big transfers of population, like we see today, but he saw those starting early on and realized that there was a, a major problem between, uh, there was nomadic farming, but then when the, the colonial interests came in and started big industrial forest companies and extracting lumber and so on, uh, it started to really start to deplete the forest and contribute to this desertification. So. He was called the conservator of forests, but he found he was actually, his real job was kind of facilitating the exploitation of the forest. And he realized he had to do something different and he needed to engage local people in forest replanting. How was he contributing to the degradation? Well, they were uh, really kind of facilitating forest companies, finding the right timber and that kind of thing. So there was, it wasn't really conservation that they were mostly concerned with. So he wanted to find a way of engaging people in tree planting. So he went to the elders of the Kikuyu tribe, which he was mostly working with, and he said, we have to plant trees. And they said, no, no, no. They said, that's God's work. God plants the trees. And he said, yeah, but we have to help God, you know, because we're interfering with his work. And so they said, well, Everything that we do is done with a dance. So we have a dance for planting, we have a dance for harvesting. So if you're going to have a tree planting, you have to create a dance. So he said, okay, that's, let's work with the culture of the local people. And so he started this dance of the trees in 1922 for youth. And he engaged the youth to come and, and, uh, and do tree planting. And so uh, they had this dance, and they had prizes, <coughs> and, uh, and he created a badge for, he called it the men of the, this organization, the men of the trees at that time. And, uh, and he would kind of engage the, the young men in tree planting, and they would pledge to plant 10 trees a year and do a good deed every day and so on. And so he had this whole process of connecting people through their culture. And uh, so this idea of kind of listening to the grassroots people, connecting with- two seconds? Yeah. Uh, you notice that he said 1922, it happened in July, a hundred years ago this year. Yeah. So this is a celebration of the centenary of the dance. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to remember, this is 1922, 2022, 1922. Sorry, Paul, I didn't yeah. mean to interfere, no, no. but that is an important point, yeah. is that we're in the centenary of that. This is the centenary this year. Yeah. From, uh, and the centenary of the Man of the Trees, right. which is now called the International Tree Foundation. ITF, yeah, right. And we are a member, the Unity Museum is a member of ITF. Uh -huh. So he became quite close to the indigenous people and the elders, and 
He became the, the first white man who was initiated into the secret society of Kukuyu elders. Right. And uh, they gave him this staff of, of, uh, of engagement with this society. Excuse me, did you say first or only? First. Okay. First. Uh, he was part of, he started this uh, tree nursery in the highlands of Kenya, 1922. And uh, Prince Charles, now King Charles III, he talked about Richard St. Bar Baker, and he very kindly wrote the introduction to my book. Uh, and so he talked about his deep engagement with indigenous people and kind of combining their worldview with, with them, what was the emerging science of ecology at the time. Uh, in his breaks from his work in Africa, he would go back to England where he also launched the Men of the Trees in England. So here he is speaking to a group of people. Uh, and I think, I'm thinking that this is the first international ENGO, environmental non-governmental organization in the world. There were other ones, uh, but not, in, not on an international basis. And at one point he had members in 108 countries. Uh, so that's really a kind of groundbreaking to have that international aspect to it. The first, Started the in first Kenya. member was who? The first member was, we'll come to that. Oh. <laughs> uh, so here's, uh, so he launched in Kenya and then Britain and next is Palestine. We we'll talked about that. So his fourth spiritual foundation was encountering the Baha'i faith. So a woman, American Baha'i named Claudia uh, Skipworth Coles, met him at the uh, Parliament of the Living Religions of the British Empire, 1924. And he was asked to speak about African religions. And so he gave up, gave a talk about what he had learned about uh, the Kukuyu religious views. And at the end of his talk, this woman came up to him and said, you're a Baha'i. And he said, what's that? And she said, you respect the other man's religion as much as your own. And so he said, well, that's true. And she gave him a book. And they became lifelong friends. And he went back to Africa reading reading these books about the Baha'i faith. And so uh, in Kenya, he got into trouble with the colonial service because he was too uh, friendly with the indigenous <clears throat> people, the local people. And on one occasion, uh, he was with a group of, of military officers and um, one of them had a, a riding crop and he went to beat this this uh, young man and Baker stepped in the way and took the blow that broke his collarbone. Mm. And so the the military didn't like that, but the, the local people liked it. <laughs> okay, here's somebody who's, who's uh, a good person and uh, he, he gained the respect of the local people, but he was kicked <clears throat> out of Kenya by the colonial service. But they reassigned him to Nigeria, and he was in charge of an area the size of France. Uh, again, found the, the exploitation underway and developed a kind of a, uh, a system which today we call agroecology uh, or tree farming. That would be an alternative way of, of farming where you use, you incorporate trees into your planting, and, and uh, they called it igu but Iggy Oko or tree farms. And uh, so traveled throughout the country, meeting with, uh, this is him meeting with local indigenous elders and leaders and kind of promoting the concept of, of forest conservation and re replanting forests. But again, he kind of got into trouble with uh, the British authorities and was uh, sort of drummed out of the, out of the colonial service. But uh, the governor of Palestine, at that point, Palestine was under a British rule as well. He had heard about his work in Africa and invited him to Palestine, where he uh, engaged with, with the um, uh, local religious leaders and, and brought them into uh, tree planting through interfaith events. 
And I'm thinking this is one of the really early examples of this interfaith collaboration on conservation. And so uh, the first thing he did though, when he came to, um, well, I, I just finished this. One of the things he, he found out about in, in, uh, in Palestine, that there was this tradition of, uh, they were called them the New Year of the Trees, and there was a tradition around a tree festival uh, planting trees at a certain time of year. So he kind of worked on reviving this festival. And uh, interestingly, uh, <coughs> Israel is one of two countries where there's more trees at the end of the 20th century than the beginning. So he had a small role in that. Uh, but the first thing he did when he got to Palestine, because he had become interested in the Baha'i faith, was go to meet the guardian of the Baha'i faith, Shoghi Effendi, in Haifa. And Shoghi Effendi, uh, when the governor of Palestine gave him a car and he went up to meet Shoghi Effendi, and Shoghi Effendi came out of his house, which was the house of Abu Baha, came out of the house and handed him an envelope. It was his life membership, the first life membership in the Men of the Trees. And he encouraged St. Barb to, to work with the religious elders. And the way that happened was kind of interesting because uh, the different religious groups, the Muslims, the Christians, the Druze, uh, the Jews, were all antagonistic to each other. And they wouldn't talk to each other. So what he did was he rented a hall. And his hall had all kinds of alcoves, sort of like this, like this one. And he would, so he got the different religious leaders to come, but he didn't tell them the other ones were coming. And so he would bring the, the mufti of Jerusalem and he'd put them in an alcove and close the curtains. And then the Jewish leaders and the Christian leaders and so on would, would come in, each in their own alcove. And then when the time to the meeting started, he pulled the, they pulled all the curtains aside, they were all in the same room. And then he explained to them this importance of tree planting he, he created this program, which is there, which shows all the patrons of the men of the trees of Palestine, who were all these religious leaders. And uh, he just took the liberty of making them all the patrons. And, and kind of they were there, and it was no longer possible for them to say no. And so they, were, they, were, they went along with it and started some interesting uh, tree planting programs. Here they are planting trees in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, there's just a couple of pictures I had of him attending Baha'i events in, in England, Baha'i summer schools, where he was often a speaker. And here he is, for example, that's uh, Hand of the Cause, Hussein Baluzi, mm -hmm. sitting in the middle and uh, hand of the cause to George Townsend in the middle of this picture, and and Hussein Baluzi. I'm not sure who that, that who that man beside George Townsend is. Is it a Fendi? No. Uh, what's his name? Oh God, I know his face. Um, is that Mr. Yazdi or? I don't know. He looks it, like a Yazdi. Uh, yeah. And anyways, there's Saint Barb sitting beside Hussein Baluzi, and you know they'd all be speakers at the summer school. And then this idea of having summer schools, he adopted that for the Men of the Trees. And here he is at the Men of the Trees summer school in 1938. You can see him there in the tuxedo in the, in, I guess I can't get my uh, right at, kind of towards the front. And this was quite a, um, quite a, Shishi event. Yeah. Uh, Tuxedo, I would say. Shishi in Hawaii means something oh, yeah. quite different than it does, I can't keep does here. It. That's right. But uh, anyway, you can see he, kind of, he kind of catered to the uh, to the the aristocracy, like he got them. He wanted to get them involved because the reason was that they were landowners, mm -hmm. and so in order for them to get engaged in more tree planting and so on, you had to engage with the land of the class. So you see lots of furs and uh, aristocratic people involved there. It's 14, 14 years, you got 5,000 members in 108 countries. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite extraordinary. And it was quite a prominent organization uh, in, in Britain and attracted royal patronage and so on. Yeah. And also, um, he became quite uh, 
he was quite a close friend of Martha Groot's, and uh, he had said that whenever he engaged with uh, combined Baha'i activities and his conservation work, the conservation always work always worked better. So he would try and do uh, when he did his world travels, he would always also connect with the Baha'is and do firesides and so on to engage with the faith. But on this incident, he was in uh, in Sweden, and Martha Ruth was there and had an assignment to meet with the King of Sweden. But she became very ill, and she had a message from Shogi Effendi from the Guardian of the Baha'i Faith and a copy of Baha'u'llah in the New Era to give. Uh, but she she was sick, so she. He happened to be there and she called him and said, will you go on my, on my behalf? And so he did. And she was big into Esperanto. Yeah. And uh, basically from 1929 to 1982, what he was all about was traveling the world and giving talks, uh, lots of radio broadcasts, later TV broadcasts, talking to reporters and so on about tree planting, conservation. And he became on these trips, very much like Martha Ruth, he would visit uh, the leaders of the countries. So here he is with uh, President Roosevelt, actually Governor Roosevelt at this time. He was the governor of New York first. And so it says, to my friend Richard St. Clair Baker, from his fellow man of the trees. My gosh. And uh, so Baker uh, always would claim that he gave the idea for the Civilian Conservation Corps, mm -hmm. which was a huge uh, conservation movement where they engaged really, I think, millions of, of men working on conservation during the Depression to give people work. But, and so I thought, is this really true? And it turns out to be partially true. Uh, I, I found some books where uh, they had records of the presidential um, you know, what influenced his thinking and setting up the Conservation Corps. He'd already done this in New York State. And, uh, but a number of people were influenced. And one of the people they mentioned was Richard St. Bar Baker, who had met with the president and, and encouraged tree planting as part of the Civilian Conservation Corps program. He also became very involved in conserving the redwoods, wrote this book, Redwoods and uh, supporting the Save the Redwoods League, and had uh, a lifelong involvement in that, that process. He wrote uh, uh, 32 books, all on trees. Uh, Sahara <coughs> Challenge and Sahara Conquest, I mentioned that guy Tony Renata at the beginning. Those are the books that he had found uh, where he talks about this whole process of desert reclamation, which we'll go into. Uh, he started what's probably the longest running international environmental journal, Trees, in 1936, still being published today. And in 1930, he was on uh, NBC's News of the World, or World News with Lowell Thomas, a famous American broadcaster, who was the first person to call him the man of the trees. And then he adopted, he also called him the Lawrence of Africa. And uh, Lowell Thomas had popularized, popularized Lawrence of Arabia. Yes. And so he kind of compared. Cool. So there's St. Barb Baker and his, oh, his Palestinian yeah. This is getting here. better all the time. And he, uh, you know, became known then as the man of the trees. And I also think of him as the original, you know, we, there's that tree, <laughs> tree, tree hugger. So he's the yeah. tree hugger. He was... He was into this tree hugging thing, and he believed that trees could heal. And I actually, you know, I did have a chance to meet him and did a little tree hugging with him. And he'd say, uh, he had a good sense of humor, so he'd say, okay, you just hold it. But he said, don't do it for too long, because it might overpower you. Mm -hmm. and just touch the, touch the tree. Uh, he started uh, in the 40s, these world forestry charter gatherings, so uh, these were meetings that he started to bring together all the ambassadors of different countries in England uh, to really look at a global view of the world's forests and how, how uh, we had to consider uh, kind of the, the concept of, um, of a world ecosystem, the ecosphere and how it was all connected and so on. So each of the nations had to develop uh, 
developed a forestry approach that had a global consciousness. And, and the Shogi family of the Guardian would send a message to every one of these gatherings, encouraging and so on. And in 1990, this was revived by the Universal House of Justice, a set of meetings. He also created the, this, um, the, uh, what are we doing? Oh, it's good to know we have an advocate out there. <laughs> Could, could I make a request? Absolutely. I'm really sleepy, and I love what you're talking about. Uh -huh. Would you excuse me to get a cup of coffee? I would. Why don't we have a coffee break? Wow. Once he's figuring out coffee break. 